like to welcome you to our uh, session, Prologue to Progress. This is hosted by our friends over at Biomarin, who are wonderful supporters of HFA and a platinum level sponsor of this symposium. And we thank them so much for their support. We're so happy to have the Biomarin team here for this session. Uh, before I turn it over, I do just want to um, thank all of our symposium sponsors sponsors that have made this event possible. It is with their support and dedication to us uh, that we're able to provide this programming. Uh, and again, uh, really appreciate um, the unwavering support from these folks who have made this possible. Uh, before I turn it over, I do just want to remind everybody who's watching that this is in a webinar format, so we are not able to see or hear you. Uh, please use the chat or the Q&A features that are available right in the bottom of your Zoom toolbar uh, to submit questions to me or the HFA team, or more importantly, to the folks from Biomarin who are about to give this presentation. Use the Q&A to submit those questions and they will do their best to get them answered at the end of the session. Uh, and with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and introduce uh, Vince from the Biomarin team to come on. And I hope you all enjoy this wonderful session presented by them. Welcome, Vince. Thanks, Kyle. So as Kyle had mentioned, uh, welcome. Uh, a good evening to everyone who's joining us. I see there's a nice crowd here tonight. Uh, in the program that you've um, joined us is Prologue to Progress, How the Power of One Story Can Shape a Narrative of Change for Others. Um, you're going to meet an amazing group of panelists tonight. We have three people for you to share um, time with, and they're going to share their stories with you, uh, their experiences in living with hemophilia, some of their advocacy efforts as well. And, um, you know, it, what's, it, what really impressed me as I went through this uh, a number of um, themes kept coming up. Um, these are very creative folks and uh, that's one thing, uh, but also they are extremely persistent in their pursuits and uh, in advocacy. And you'll see that as well, I think. Um, so I'm really excited for you to meet everyone. Uh, for those folks who may not know me, uh, I'll start out by introducing myself. And I'm Vince Poma, I'm with Biomarin. I work in the commercial team and I live in the Southeast United States in Kentucky. Uh, I have been in hemophilia and, and involved with the community uh, since 2006. So this was my 15th year and time flies when you're having fun. So um, I'm very uh, interested and excited to meet all of you when we get back live again in San Antonio next year. So with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, first up tonight, you're gonna meet Jonathan Hill and Jonathan is the author of Blood of the Paladin which is a graphic novel based on his true life experiences in living with uh, HIV, uh, hepatitis, and as well as hemophilia, severe hemophilia. So uh, Jonathan, would you like to say hi to the crowd? Sure, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, I, as Vince said, I, I have the, the triple H's or I, I encountered the triple H's on my journey. Uh, I, uh, I was uh, born with severe hemophilia A and, um, I unfortunately had to um, to experience the uh, the, the contamination crisis and uh, and had to uh, learn to live with uh, HIV and uh, hepatitis C. Awesome. We're going to be spending some time with Jonathan in just a minute. So thanks, Jonathan. And um, next up, you're going to meet Max Feinstein. And Max is uh, not only a musician; he's a producer. He works in the video medium as well. Extremely creative guy and uh, a strong advocate for the bleeding disorders community. And you'll get to hear a little bit about, about his lineage and also um, what his creative process has led to recently, which is uh, really cool. So you're, we're gonna talk to Max. Max, did you wanna say hi to everybody before we get going? Hello, uh, thank you for being here with us tonight. It's my privilege to speak to you all. Thanks, Max. And lastly, you're going to meet Gordon Vihar. Uh, Gordon and I work at Biomarin, and he is our Vice President for External Innovation. Um, and earlier in Gordon's career, he led the team that cloned the Factor 8 gene successfully. And as you can imagine, that's led to just a number of therapeutic options now for the community. And, you know, when I think about it, it's not just what's happened here in the United States. It's it's affected uh, folks globally living with 
severe factor eight deficiency. So Gordon, welcome. I'm sure you want to say hi. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here. And I'm looking forward to sharing some of my stories in the time we have here. Awesome. So we're going to get right to it and uh, spend a little time with Jonathan Hill. So um, Jonathan, um, as I read Blood of the Paladin, the graphic novel, and also participated in the podcast, um, you know, what I noticed is you were really vocal in telling your story and uh, vividly telling your story and involving your friends and family. You know, why was it important for you to share your story with the community? What, what made you want to do it? Well, um, you know, number one, I, I wanted to um, uh, potentially provide hope and encouragement to others struggling uh, with a bleeding disorder or other serious chronic condition. Um, you know, I, I wanted to try and share some of the lessons I had learned uh, about uh, living with hemophilia and uh, the associated uh, uh, complications. And, and then also, you know, I thought it was really important to, to tell um, stories from, from my generation of hemophilics, who unfortunately we lost so many of uh, in the 1980s and early 90s uh, to the, uh, the contamination crisis and, and never forget the amazing courage and bravery that, that uh, our brothers and sisters um, uh, in the bleeding disorders community, uh, you know, exhibited over the years. There's no doubt about that. And uh, I thought you, you did a great job in telling your story. I know, you know, you're packing a, a lifetime of experiences into, you know, one graphic novel, but it has been impactful. I will tell you, um, and I'll share that in just a little bit, but um, I, I'm more interested in hearing, you know, what, what, ha what has been the impact of the graphic novel from your perspective what have you heard from others in the community? Well, you know, uh, the, the, I, I, first of all, Vince, I've, I've been really uh, humbled by the response from people, you know, and their, their, uh, their connection and their empathy towards me has been just amazing. Um, but even beyond that, you know, um, to hear um, a brother in, in hemophilia that, um, was also waiting for a liver transplant, and unfortunately, um, he did not get one. He passed away uh, this last month. Uh, but it brought some hope and encouragement to his family, um, you know, his daughters and his wife, and that that meant a lot to me. And and to find another brother that uh, had a passion for progressive rock music. So so we we traded a bunch of texts over the months, uh, and I. I knew what it was like to be in the hospital, you know, for weeks at a time. And, uh, you know, to, 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 to be able to try and help him, you know, uh, think about something else, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, use his imagination. That was really important to me. Uh, you know, I, I had a doctor um, that uh, one of my uh, transplant docs that uh, I gave him a copy of the graphic novel and he, he got pretty emotional about it. He said, you know, he, he told me about this story about a young boy with hemophilia uh, in Chicago in the, in the 90s that he wasn't able to save. And, you know, how important it was to him to hear my story that I, that I, that I was able to endure and keep going. And that, you know, that was very powerful. And, um, you know, I, uh, I even, we even got coverage on the graphic novel in Dragon Plus, which is the online Dungeons and Dragons magazine. Uh, and, uh, you know, about the, about the graphic novel and how important uh, role-playing games and Dungeons and Dragons are to me. And out of that, uh, somebody reached out, one of their readers reached out to uh, the, uh, the Believe Limited website and said, hey, you know, I got into Dungeons and Dragons because of my brother who had hemophilia and he's not here anymore, but this really connected with me. So, you know, just amazing stories like that. Just amazing. And it all started with you having enough courage to kind of 
share that. I know, you know, in, in reading a little bit about you, you, you created memoirs initially, right? And then mm -hmm. put some things on Facebook and then it led to eventually, you know, this, this uh, beautiful, I mean, the, the publishing is, is wonderful. The, the colors and the, the print, the, the pictures are great. It's inspirational. And, uh, you know, but that all took some courage, really. Right. And. Um, yeah, but, you know, it, it was it was courage, but it also um, it really expanded my support network, you know, people that were were pulling for me, uh, you know, both uh, physically and, and some, you know, just uh, emotionally. And, uh, you know, it, it it really empowered me uh, to keep to keep sharing my story as I as I, as I put my thoughts out there, you know, cause I, at first I thought, well, you know, someone should talk about this cause this is a lot to go through. And, um, um, but I didn't know if it would connect with people and it did. And, uh, so that's just been amazing. Totally yeah. amazing. Well, can I share? So I was at a uh, walk here in hemophilia last weekend and I had, uh, some of the copies out and um, someone came up to the table who I've known for a long time and his volunteer. He said, I never pick up anything pamphlet wise. He goes, I just don't, you know, he goes, mm -hmm. but this has really got me intrigued. And he said, <laughs> I'm going to take it and read it. So I would, I just wanted you to know that it's, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's living proof is a hard, he's a hard critic. And he was like, he was, he was excited. He said, this is really cool. And I, and I thought to myself, you know, this can really, connect with people of all ages so absolutely yeah. so yeah. that's that's great to hear Vince so thank you for sharing that absolutely so I did want to ask about a little bit about your uh, fighting for your health you know you spent a lot of years fighting for your own health advocating right. for yourself whether you know it was hemophilia or HIV or even hepatitis you know wh why do you think it's so important to advocate for yourself and I know you had a lot of help you know, you had people that advocated for you too, when you couldn't, or, you know, you maybe, right. But why was it so, why is it so important when it comes to our health to do that? Well, you know, um, um, I, I grew up in the eighties, uh, and I went to hemophilia camp, uh, like many of, uh, and many of my, uh, community members and it was really important. And, you know, the hemophilia treatment center, um, provided integrated care and it was just, wonderful to be able to talk about everything going on. But as I became a teenager, I started to realize, hey, you know, my parents and the HTC have taught me all this stuff, but it's now up to me. <laughs> you know, it's, it's all yeah. centered on me. I, you know, I have to take responsibility for my own medical, um, you know, situation and, and be responsible. And they gave me the tools uh, to, to try and manage it. Um, but uh, it was all on me. So that was a big lesson to learn. Uh, and it's not an easy lesson to learn. Um, you know, and then just, um, you know, to, to surround yourself with that, with that support network, you know, whether it's friends or family or, or whoever in your life that, that will be there, uh, you know, it will drive you to the hospital in the middle of the night when you bang your head. So, uh, you know, it's, it's really important. And then the other thing I got to be honest is, um, you know, you fall down sometimes, you know, you have an, you have an injury or, or you have a, you know, uh, a situation develop where you end up in the hospital for an extended period of time. And you got to be able to dust yourself off and get back up again. I mean, like my dad used to say, you know, one foot in front of the other and you'll, you'll get there. Uh, and he was right. He was right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a lifelong journey, Vince. Well, thank you for being so open about all this, Jonathan, and for, you know, sharing your creative passion with us. And I did want to ask, you know, for a while we have your, your section here is the last question we have for, for you until later is, you know, what's next for you with regards to, you know, either writing or advocacy, you know, what, what have you got plans for next? Well, I'm, I'm continuing to share the graphic novel. 
Um, you know, like you said, it, this recent event in was it in, in Los Angeles that 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 that, that uh, somebody came up and wanted to check it out. Uh, so there's that, and we're doing some events. We've got an event here. It is up the slide um, next week. Uh, the Believe Limited guys and I are, are hosting a behind the scenes. So if you want to know how we put this thing together, you know, how we got the artists involved, you know, you know, how, how hard is it to roll a natural 20? Are those, all those kinds of important questions, Vince. Uh, you know, this is, this is the session for you. So I really encourage everybody to come. Uh, it's going to be, you know, open uh, questions about uh, the process, myself, and, and all that kind of stuff. So just a, a great way to learn more. And you had already mentioned the, um, you know, the, uh, the fact that there's a podcast too. So that's great too, to check out. Uh, in fact, my, one of my coworkers, um, you know, I suggest that you check it out. And, you know, he's not much for reading. <laughs> so he, uh he, he, he loved the podcast and he really, he really um, felt like he got to know me a lot more, you know, and all the things I had been through. So that, that was really special. Um, we're hoping maybe in 2022, uh, we can do some in-person events. Uh, that's still possible. We're, we're trying to look into that. Maybe even um, the Bleeding Disorders Conference next year or something like that. Um, so we'll see what happens. Um, but I, again, I encourage you guys to sign up for the book club uh, next week if you want to. Um, the website's right there on the, on the screen. Um, and I guess the last little tease I'd give you is uh, I've started working on a spec script um, to turn, in, turn, the, uh, turn the graphic novel and my memoir into uh, a full movie script uh, and see, see where that goes. You know, I, I'm doing it for myself. Uh, I know that that's a long road, but I think it's, these stories are so important to tell and we have to keep telling them. So anyway, thank you, Vince. You're welcome. You're so welcome. We, we thank you. And don't forget about us when you make the big time in the movie <laughs> business. Promise? I promise. All I promise. right. Thanks, I, Vince. Yeah, and I have to say too that the the podcast was fantastic. It really did bring everything to life. That the production on it is is great. There's lots of voiceovers and voice acting on there, uh, which really yeah. brings it to life too. So very cool. R really, really well done. So thanks. Well, we're thank gonna you. you got it, and we're gonna come back to Jonathan in just a little bit um, for some one final kind of group question. And also I do wanna encourage um, you in the audience, if you have questions, you can put them in the Q and A or the chat or later as, as you're learning about our panelists tonight, if something comes up that you wanna know more about later, we will do the best that we can to answer your questions tonight, okay? So I'm um, gonna go ahead and move on. And let me get uh, the slide here. All right, hopefully you can see that. Um, so Max Feinstein is joining us. Uh, Max, um, there you are, great. And we got you on mute. Uh, but he's, um, as, as I discussed a little bit before, Max is a musician. And you know, the first question I had for you, Max, was take me back to when you started playing guitar. And uh, was that your first instrument? And how old were you at the time? You know, And why did you start playing? So it wasn't my first instrument. Okay. Um, I, as other musicians or other, you know, children, was kind of thrown into some all-purpose music classes when I was in elementary school, which probably had some rudimentary choir, sort of rounding the bandstand on things like mallet instruments, which retrospectively was a privilege. Uh, I remember seeing Alvin and the Chipmunks, something or other, and Alvin always played a harmonica. So I asked for a harmonica and could do absolutely nothing with it. Uh, my parents were really kind of lovely in letting me chase those windmills, so to speak. Um, uh, the, the, the bandstand included, yeah, my, my parents would say that I rounded the bandstand, so to speak, with flute, clarinet, and saxophone during elementary school. And I had nothing for embouchure, which is where you, with your mouth and make all those fun noises uh, with the uh, woodwind and reed instruments. Uh, so for a while that just sort of sat. And then in middle school around the age of 11 or 12, 
I saw a, a kid in my grade playing, you know, Nirvana with his friends and his crappy little band in, you know, because that's what you are. You're, you're a teenager and you're learning things and you're getting the feel for it. And you get this kid playing really loudly and you hear these loud drums in front of you and you just kind of want to be a part of it. And I was a weird kid to begin with. So when you take a chronic disorder and you throw that on top of being naturally eccentric, you, you feel like an alien twice over. So not only do you feel kind of angry about that, so some loud guitars feel mighty cathartic, but you also feel as though that can be sort of a commonality between you and your peers. So that way, if you're feeling like 100% hemophilia, maybe 100, you know, maybe 50% hemophilia, 50% guitar is uh, a better ratio to go with, you know? Mm -hmm. well, and I'm curious about that, Max, when you said, um, you know, being, being younger and having hemophilia, did, was this an outlet for you? Did you feel like having music and being able to express, you know, frustration or anger was a great outlet for hemophilia? Was that even a thought or when you kind of look back on it? It was a refuge. I tried to treat it as the sort of the last bastion of my life that wasn't taken over by the disorder. Everybody kept saying, oh, you know, you should write about it. You should talk talk about it, you should be about it. And that's really what our community is about. And ultimately what I've returned to, you know, it's very much a prodigal son, son story is, is my story. But to, to say so, I, I didn't want that. I wasn't there. I was overtaken by the disorder. You know, when you're growing up with this, it's hard to bridle it. And everybody just wants you to be all about it when you don't have the vocabulary or the constitution to. So I really, you know, it was the early 2000s, pop punk was vogue. So I stuck a big proverbial middle finger up in the air about it for a very long time. Well, it was just kind of where, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, that is who I am. I, I am, you know, you can't take the middle finger out of your heart, um, so to speak, but it, it's very much, you know, to be loud and to have a lot of this sort of cathartic and sometimes sort of celebratory aspects of, of music that, that I, I feel I've sort of held close to my heart throughout the years, depending on what I've done. It's certainly changed in aesthetic, but uh, I, I, it's nice to be able to sort of apply that backward to, uh, to, to the facets of my life that were here from the beginning. Yeah. Well, you know, when we, um, go, going back to even last year, which was a huge change too, right? I mean, for everybody and, but for you, I mean, did it, did it change your outlook on having hemophilia last year? Did you do things differently or pursue uh, things you had been putting off? You know, what, how was that for you? I had started to return to the community in earnest, perhaps the year before. In 2019, I released uh, an EP called Betamax. And uh, in order to court publicity for that record, I used, uh, I leveraged my story. Uh, because it coincided with the diagnosis of my osteoarthritis in the right elbow. And, uh, you know, what they say, bad blood makes for good publicity. So uh, I, I sort of leveraged my rarefied bleeding disorder uh, externally, because when you look at that in the context of media, uh, it makes for a good story to tell outward because it's novel. You know, right now I'm talking to a bunch of hemos and hemo adjacent. That's nothing new, but being able to be a storyteller of a different breed uh, allows me to uh, have something else to say to you guys. Normally, I'm educating about hemophilia outward, um, but you know I don't have to explain hemophilia to anyone. And there are a bunch of people here who can school me many times over on the subject, which is amazing. Uh, but yeah, so fall of 2019, I started to really reintegrate in earnest. And around Washington days, which I got to participate in 2020, I. Uh, you know, the world shut down again, and I kind of figured out how to reconnect a little bit with the community digitally. I had the privilege of participating in a bunch of things virtually. You know, a lot of people didn't have a whole lot to do, so I had the privilege of people's time in, in terms of conversations, and I had the privilege of uh, taking the time to rehabilitate my right elbow with another hemo, Dr. Mike Zolo, uh, and through the process of that, I was able to write the record that I'm currently promoting. Let's talk about that, which is, I'm just, you know, so that, I mean, uh, in, in, uh, as I think about it, some weird, but good things came out of last year, right. For folks when he, I mean, that not, it wasn't all good. Right. But, uh, some, some good things can come in and, you know, you mentioned that you're releasing an album 
early next year. I know you've already released one single and you want to, can we talk about that a little bit? The, As of today, it's two singles. It is. Okay. So today you released another single. Yes. And I'm pleased to say it was also my first music video. Uh, the song I released today, well, I'll, I'll start with the song that I released in uh, August, which is called Dear Anxious. And it's been, I'm, I'm pleased to say that, that it's sort of been well received in, in terms of its intention, which to me was sort of the, the notion of having sort of made peace with the fact that I'm buying to be something of a leader in the community, that I'm buying to tell stories in a different way and the accountability that I place on myself to do so with dignity and integrity uh, and to be a public figure with as much grace as I can uh, and the responsibilities, again, that come with that. Uh, and in order to give that sort of uh, hopeful uh, bend any sort of credence, I had to take it back to where it began, which was with the misanthropic individual that I truly am at heart. Uh, what I've kind of affectionately called the unreachables. Uh, with, and that's where uh, we start here with a song called uh, Borderlines, which I released today. And it's accompanying music video is uh, sort of a story that is a an only mildly exaggerated excerpt of different aspects of my life. Anyone who has hemophilia or anyone who has raised a hemophiliac or has uh, been raised next to one, the hemos and hemo adjacent can tell you how much rage and depression uh, is, is cycling through them during their lowest and uh, how sometimes they have uh, perhaps let it get the better of them and done some things that perhaps they, uh, cannot take back things that they can't uh, help either. Uh, and as you get older, you realize what you put other people through, but are still perhaps less capable of stopping yourself from going into these fits and going through this sort of rage and you don't know how to make it better. And one day you just start bit by bit. So Borderlines is sort of about that. It's, it's ultimately a story of isolationism, depression, rage, and ultimately self-determination to improve one's situation. And where can we find this song, this, this new single? You can find it on any streaming platform that you like, uh, and you can find the music video on YouTube. It's, uh, you know, just Max Feinstein Borderlines. It's, it's, uh, it should pop right up. The, the, the screen grab is me sort of rolling around in my own medical waste. Awesome, Max. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I did have, um, you know, I know your lineage goes back deep, you know, with uh, some family that was involved in advocacy. So you had, you had some, you know, you had some um, strong representatives in front of you. Can you talk about that? You know, how, how you got involved in advocacy work and, um, you know, your family as well? Um, it goes back to my mother. My mother was Anna D. Simone, and Anna D. Simone was uh, kind of a force of nature as a woman. She was about the most principled and ardent advocate of the disorder that I uh, have ever known. And when I say that, I should hope to goodness that anyone in here with a hemo mom would say the same thing about their own, because my story is exactly the same as every other hemo you know, every other kid with hemophilia has a mom that, you know, is really just actively fighting for the well-being of their child. That's the, our story. That is the classic hemophilia story. Mom gets pregnant. Kid gets diagnosed. Mom freaks out, goes into overdrive, preserving the quality of life to the best of her ability, and will fight tooth and nail for the well-being of their child that generally speaking may thrust them into community service. And if it goes further, then they become a true servant of the community in terms of their employment and dedicating their lives to it. And that is where my mother truly uh, went. Uh, she was uh, heavily involved in the Hemophilia Association of New Jersey. And during the early 2000s, she was part of an NHF initiative called Project Red Flag. You know, as she uh, started to diversify into uh, specifically more uh, women and girls with blood disorders, which is ultimately where she uh, was at the end of her life. Well, she was just 
an awesome model for you. And, you know, um, we're thankful you're back and, you know, heavily involved and in, in creating. And I know this album was thematic in, well, it ended up being thematic. I know from talking to you, it wasn't necessarily how you started out thinking about it, but it, it just kind of came together that way. And um, so we're, we're all excited to, to listen to it, Max, and to, I'm going to look for the video tonight. I did want to have uh, one last question for you before we go to the group eventually is um, what advice would you give folks in the community? Um, what would you, what would you like to tell them or advice that you would give them based on your experiences? You know how we have that old adage of sharing your story. So I would say that I've come against a couple of roadblocks with that one. I would say that we cannot shy away from the darkness in this community. And I know that's a funny thing to say, given that we're literally talking about a blood disorder where blood goes where it shouldn't go. And that's a horrifying reality to live with. But we also have this heritage of HIV and AIDS that Jonathan is so gracefully depicting with his medium, you know. That our disorder is the theater of the absurd, and I really cannot stress enough that we need to not shy away from that. Do not worry about whether or not what you're discussing is too dark. Do not worry about whether or not what you're hearing someone discuss is too dark. Let it out. Let it go through. We've been through enough. Come on, let's let's level with each other. Let's let's try and be as honest and cathartic with each other as possible. That is, that is my hope for this community. Well said, Max. And thank you for the time. Really appreciate it. We're gonna get a chance to, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, it's my privilege. Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. And uh, we're gonna get a chance to kind of go back and group at the end for any questions we have for the community. And I know there's probably one or two at least. All right, I'm gonna, um, bring on now Gordon VR and Gordon I'm just trying to get to your there we go uh, to your to your uh, placeholder here your slide um, Gordon thanks for spending some time with us you know folks may not know who you are but you know certainly you've touched a lot of their lives whether they know it or not and you know your current roles in external innovation and are a vice president for Biomarin but you've been in hemophilia research since the beginning of your career. Um, you know, how did you get started and, you know, what led you to work in the field of, you know, cloning factor eight and even getting involved with factor eight? How did you get started there? Um, for, first of all, correction. I think one of my colleagues with a sense of humor has changed my login name. Um, <laughs> so if I ever have the pleasure of meeting any of you, I go by Gordon, not Gordo. Um, I shall find revenge. Um, uh, I started um, actually back in 1975. So I've been in the hemophilia field basic research for over 40 years. Um, I, I moved to Seattle in 75 to join uh, what at the time was the world's largest coagulation lab, about 20 people working on coagulation. Uh, but no one was working on factor eight, which surprised me. Uh, eight at the time was nothing much was known about it other than that there was something in normal blood that could uh, correct hemophilic blood. Uh, but that was about it. Uh, and as a result, the treatment at the time was pretty much limited for hemophilia A to freeze-dried powders and cryoprecipitate. It was pretty bad. Um, the advice I got when I joined the lab from the other postdocs uh, when I was there was don't do factor eight. It's a career killer. No one ever, ever succeeds. Uh, and the thing I've told many people, the person who preceded me in working on factor eight in the lab actually had a mental breakdown. It was in, institutionalized. Wow. Um, I was in my late 20s. Uh, risk isn't really something people in their 20s think about. I thought it seemed like a nice challenge. Uh, so I picked that up uh, as my project. It took five years, um, but uh, and it, part of that was funded by the NHF from a Judith Graham Poole Fellowship, um, in, which I'll come back to uh, later on. Uh, and, and while I was there for five years, I got enough, and I, I switched to cow blood rather than human, just for the quantities one could get. Uh, and I was successful. I was able to now for the first time prove that factor eight was a large and very complex protein. And it was not von Willebrand protein, which was a big confusion in the field at the time. Uh, that set up the race to try to clone it. Cloning was just coming on in the, in the late seventies and early eighties. And I decided to join uh, my career, leave Seattle and join the experts, which at the time was 
a small company called Genentech, 50 people in the corner of a warehouse in South San Francisco. Uh, they had cloned most of the proteins at the time. That seemed like the place to go. When I got there, I realized that the factor eight was not for recombinant DNA at the time. Uh, based on what I had done in Seattle, factor eight protein was at least 10 times larger than anything had ever been cloned. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they had no way at that time to try to make it in the laboratory. The conditions were too harsh uh, for an unstable protein like factor eight. So we, we fortunately with Genentech, it was dedicated to trying to, to make new drugs with the new technology. And we spent four years developing the necessary technology that could be applied to something as large and complex as factor eight. So it took four years, but we were able to, to successfully do that. Uh, we published three back-to-back -back papers in the science journal Nature. Uh, and pretty much overnight, factor eight went from, like I said, a mystery activity uh, in plasma that no one could really understand to in those papers, we had the sequence of the protein, uh, the entire protein, we could identify what the different proteins that composed factor eight and how they fit together in, in the gene. We defined the gene and the introns and the exons and all the sequences, uh, encoded it there and started to define the genetics of hemophilia, just what went wrong in the gene that led to the defects. Um, and most importantly, we could make, we showed we could make factor eight in the laboratory that was functional and could correct hemophilic plasma. And that formed the basis for what Genentech eventually licensed the buyer for their factor eight. Uh, and was pretty much, as you mentioned, the breakthrough that was the foundation for all subsequent factor eight products. Uh, Genentech unfortunately decided to leave the hemophilia field. I continued there in non-hematology areas, just continued to work on developing recombinant proteins, left for a small stint in an oncology company, biotech startup, but managed to get back into genetic diseases when I joined Biomarin in 2008 as the vice president of research. Uh, and it was at Biomarin where I was fortunate enough to once again return to the hemophilia research field. Um, that's sort of a very quick summary of about 45 years of my work in biotech <laughs> and hemophilia. But uh, I wanna to return to the little bit of time I have to the, the theme of the session, which is the power of one story, uh, and then it can have large impacts. And, Although as Matt said, it's dark, uh, it's actually the truth. Uh, and I want to tell just a couple of stories of how it influenced my interest in hemophilia. Uh, when I joined the lab in Seattle, I, I knew protein chemistry, hardcore science, basic science training, uh, but the science of, of uh, biochemistry leaves out the personal impact of the disease. And that's where I credit the head of the lab in Seattle. He, he was an expert scientifically. He was the one who first proposed the, the coagulation cascade. Um, but he also knew how to motivate people and bring meaning uh, to what seems at the time academic research. And what he did in the lab was he would go to the UW undergraduates and he would identify students who had hemophilia and he'd go out and reach out to them and hire them to work in the laboratory, uh, mm -hmm. help fund their, their science uh, or their undergraduate work, but also impact on the people working in the lab on the basic science, what the disease actually meant to people. Uh, so we worked side by side. We got to hear the stories of the treatment at the time, growing up with hemophilia, the impact. Uh, he also bought me the book by Robert Massey called Journey. I don't think you have read that. It's, uh, it brought home to me the devastating impact of hemophilia A on individuals and their families back in the 60s and 70s before there was really adequate therapies. Uh, at that time, something like crown precipitate was considered life-changing, and now we consider that the dark ages. And, and just having that personal interactions and the story and context gave me a goal that we something had to be done to make it better. Um, that encouraged me to apply the NHF for funding, or he did, um, just to help link me to the community. Part of that grant that I got was to come to the hemophilia meetings to give updates on the science. Uh, and sort of, I think he knew it, but it was, I didn't realize it. Uh, to meet the community, to meet the people, meet the patients, get involved. Uh, and, and that stayed with me today, uh, to the point that when we cloned factor eight at Genentech, I reached out to the NHF and had the, the leaders of NHF, we flew them out to Genentech on the day that we announced the cloning, um, so that they were there, they could hear what was going on, and we had a big uh, company celebration. So they were there, and they were the ones who actually cut the cake 
for celebration with the board. Can vote. you share how long that was that transpired between the initial grant and that time when they got to uh, hear I, the I, got the, I got the grant in 76 uh, to 78 and the Colonial was published in fall of 84. Oh, wow. Um, so, um, and then talking to them, it was my stories on science and, and what motivated me to let them to start putting more of their Graham, Truth Graham Pool fellowships back into more basic research funding, uh, whereas before they were more focused on nurse training. Uh, so again, my story, science uh, helped drive them. So um, I've tried to keep up with the hemophilia community as I can. Again, I've been in and out of the field over the years. Um, I've tried to reestablish with the NHF, the Hem World Hemophilia Foundation, went to the, the New England chapter, hemophilia chapter for a TED type talk a couple yeah. years ago. Um, COVID uh, has definitely in, impeded a lot of that. I'm hoping to be able to get out uh, again, hopefully 2022 when things are open up again and reestablish some of the personal contacts that, that to me were so important in shaping my career and keeping me focused on hemophilia. Yeah. I'll stop there. No, that's awesome. And thank you for sharing all that. You know, I did have a couple more questions about, so the cloning in the factor eight gene led to some treatments. Can you talk about other things it's led to, uh, you know, the types of treatments it's led to and, and what other scientific breakthroughs you felt like, you know, getting that uh, figured out and then even produced later, you know, how to, how to actually produce it. But the, yeah, the cloning sort of defined what factor eight was, which no one knew. And that enabled all the companies that were trying to make uh, factor eight products. They knew what the goal was. Uh, and the, the companies, they tended not to sue each other, which was nice. It was, it's a community. So each was able to develop different versions of factor eight. Uh, and they sort of bridged off their own scientific developments. So as they learned more, that, that same basic understanding led to the longer half-life. Uh, factor eight, the second generation, um, uh, defining, uh, not therapies, but defining the genetics, just what was the basis for it, trying to help uh, families for diagnostic uh, purposes. So it, it, it redefined the whole field from, like I said, the dark ages, what is it no one knew, to the ability to do a wide variety of applications trying to find new, new life-changing therapies. Just amazing, absolutely amazing. And thank you for sharing that. You know, you also, um, you've been a lot involved in a lot of other scientific projects, including some inventions and obviously publications um, and what you do now. I mean, when you think back through everything that you've been involved with as a scientist, you know, speaking as a scientist, what is the biggest accomplishment from your perspective uh, that you're most proud of? I've had I've had the fortune of being in a lot of opportune times uh, to work on a lot of projects. Uh, Activase, the heart attack drug, uh, it's also used for stroke. A couple of other ones that were, again, dramatic impacts ther therapeutically, mm -hmm. but they were short stints. It was two or three years, four years, you're in and out, you make a contribution and you move on. Mm -hmm. um, factor eight is, is in hemophilia is I started my career in it. Um, I had a success mid-career at Genentech with the cloning, left for a while, and like I said, have now had the opportunity to get back, and now it's just, it's always been in my life, it seems, um, and it's, it's, just, it's sort of part of my soul, this factor eight and, and the whole field. Well, I really appreciate you sharing everything you did and, uh, and for how involved you've been. And, you know, it's a calling, right? Keep coming back to it, and, uh, and we're thankful for that. So, yeah, and, and my thanks to the editors for correcting the name. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out who did that. I want a name. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to ask um, all our panelists to come back on video if they would, if you wouldn't mind. And we'll have uh, some time for some group discussion. How's that? I'm trying to advance here. Here we go. We got questions. So if you have questions now, uh, I, I did see a couple come into chat, so we'll talk about those. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in just a second. I did wanna ask the panelists something uh, while we're still loading up a few more questions, which is, um, I have, you know, when I think of the final kind of question I'd love to hear from you is, you know, what is it you hope that the hemophilia takes, the community takes away 
you know, or how are they inspired from what you have to say? And why don't we start with you, Jonathan? Um, what is it you hope they take away today? Well, I, I think um, I would love it if they, if they would uh, feel inspired to share their story, uh, you know, uh, with, with friends or family or uh, the community or through their music or through stories or whatever, you know, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I can't say enough how important I think it is that, that, that we share all those moments. And as, as Max said, even those dark moments need to be shared too, because there are lessons to be learned in those. So. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Max. What would you say? I would say that, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, amplify Jonathan's amplification of my thing. I would say most importantly to me is not to let anyone tell you how to share your story. If uh, someone is telling you that it's not a good idea to share your story in such a way, outside of drawing a firearm and firing it into a crowd, you are doing the right thing. You know, outside of violently impacting someone else's life, if someone tells you you're sharing your story in the wrong way, share it louder. Thanks, Max. And uh, awesome. Gordon, not Gordo. Gordon. <laughs> Thanks for the correction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I pointed you... out just how early in my career, just the, the personal stories and and hear, hearing what was behind the disease and how it impacted people's life. That's meant so much to me to this day. Um, it, it, it changed my my interests in my career. So stories like that uh, are incredibly valuable. Well, great. Well, I appreciate all you guys uh, doing that. Um, the first question I had, um, and this is, um, this is from someone in Arizona mentioned, how could I get involved? You know, where do I begin? And I, I guess I would say uh, this question should go to you, Max. What would you suggest to someone who has never been involved or doesn't even know how to share their story? What, what would you recommend? So the magnificent privilege we have as a greening disorders community is the sheer magnitude of nonprofits in our network. We may be only 25, 30,000 people in, in, in the bleeding disorders community, you know, patients, but there are scores of nonprofits, uh, you know, almost essentially one for each state. And not, if it's not one for each state, then definitely adjacent territories where you live. I would say uh, do yourself a quick Google, figure out what your state or territory chapter is and uh, give the executive director a phone call. See uh, where it is you might be able to be of service or where it is that they might be able to benefit from your participation. Great advice, Max. Thanks. Thank you for that. Uh, Gordon, uh, we did get a couple questions specifically for you. Um, one, and so I'll just have you stand, there's two questions. Do you have hemophilia and was your Seattle organization Athen? I, I do not have that hemophilia. And what about Seattle? Was your organization that you were involved with in Seattle Athen? No, I was at the University of Washington. Okay. okay. So Steve sent that question in. Um, let's see. And I'm just trying to get to all these questions. So, um, so this one goes to uh, Jonathan, and that is, um, it, it, it comes from um, Billy. He says, as we encourage conversation amongst the bleeding disorder community, what's the biggest hurdle that you faced in getting started sharing your story? And then also what's been the biggest unforeseen return that you've experienced? That's a great question. Uh, um, I would say uh, the, the biggest challenge I had was I didn't think anyone wanted to hear my story. 
<laughs> you know, and as I started to write it down and share it, what I discovered as what Max said is, is the power of sharing, of sharing your story, you know, others connected with me. So um, that would be uh, what I would say uh, is the first step. Um, as far as um, the biggest return, that's, that's a toughie. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I told you those stories about those, those, uh, community members that I've connected with, uh, through the graphic novel and that, you know, uh, has made a major difference in my life. And I, I hope it's made a major difference in their lives. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I shared the stories about, uh, the, you know, uh, the, the doctors and my, it, that had also been affected. Um, uh, I think I, 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 uh, I can't think of any other at the moment, but, but there are, there are plenty. I mean, there's even, uh, uh, a woman that was telling me that she read the story to her daughter every night as a bedtime story. I thought that was just amazing. So hard to pick one right <laughs> yeah i know it's really tough <laughs> well we're running out of time i want to thank you all for being on here tonight i mean I, we could easily and, and the audience doesn't know but i got to spend you know a solid hour with each of you and i felt like we could have gone on so and, and we only got a little bit of each of you tonight so you know i hope to do this again with you all and uh, hear about you know the latest projects you're involved in and how you're how you're energized. Um, I did want to um, offer up, I think everyone sees the, the power of storytelling and uh, tonight and that everybody does have a story to tell. You can, you can, you can see that, um, you know, Jonathan just said he didn't know if his story was significant enough. Sure. I, I've had felt that way myself in my lifetime. And, uh, and you, you really, you know, that's, that's really not for us to decide, right? And so, you know, what we what we would love for you to do if you're out there and you have a story to tell is is uh, send us a 30 second video if you if you have a story you want to tell, or if you want to send um, a short, uh, like 250 words or less, uh, email. Um, you can do so to biomarinhemophilia.com. And we may find a way to amplify your story and find out more about it. And um, certainly we would touch base with you to make that happen. Um, the, there are only a couple, couple rules here. You know, you have to be 18 years or older. Um, there's a little privacy policy that you can look at, um, you know, which can be found on the link that's listed on the screen here. Um, and so, you know, that, that's it. And then, you know, lastly, you know, we ask that you don't share any stories about um, gene therapy research or anything, you know, gene therapy that you've been involved in. It's, uh, it's more about your personal story. All right. So um, if you're feeling inspired, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Kyle in just a second, but I wanted to encourage you that if you're not uh, connected with BioMarin, there's a lot of different ways to do so. There's a QR code over here in the left corner of your screen. Just take your phone and uh, put your camera on that. It'll take you to um, a page where you can put in your information and be kept up to date on the latest in clinical developments. Any news that we have to share is shared very quickly there. Um, also, any resources that we may have in creative uh, uh, workshops, things in your area, other educational resources are shared there. Um, our websites, as I had mentioned, biomarinhemophilia.com. We also have a Facebook page, which is Speak Out by Biomarin, and you'll find a lot of your friends from the community there and a YouTube channel. Uh, so with that, I want to um, thank you again for your attention tonight. I'm going to hand it over to Kyle. I know he has a few things to say, and until we all get together again, I hope everyone has a great rest of their HFA. Kyle? Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Vince, and thank you to Jonathan and Gordon and Max for sharing your stories tonight. We're so appreciative of you all for taking the time to be here. Um, 
For everybody watching at home, I do just want to bring your attention to the next sessions that we have starting in just five minutes at 7 p.m. Eastern. We are offering a session called Finding Financial Resources presented by the HFA Services Team. They're going to walk through our Helping Hands programs, patient assistance portals, government um, financial assistance programs that exist uh, sort of as a one-stop shop and an overview of all of the resources that are available. Uh, that same session is being offered in both English and Spanish at the same time in two different Zoom webinars. You can find all of that just by navigating to the agenda session of the website. Uh, and with the click of a button, you'll be entered in there. So thank you so much for joining. Uh, hope to see you all in the sessions following this and tomorrow at our final night event. Thanks again to the BioMarin team. We really appreciate you being here. Have a great night, everyone.